they're going to pay some cash in return for naming rights sponsorship. So uh, we actually have a little bit, little bit of uh, pressure off now on the uh, on the budget. Uh, and also they're going to be offering discount accommodation in uh, in Bali. So as soon as we can, we'll get there'll be a booking code. So anybody who, who wants to take advantage of that discounted accommodation can uh, can make make the booking. And uh, the last thing, and uh, this is probably of particular interest for the boats that are going to race up, but maybe also for cruisers, it looks like it's now quite practical to get a container uh, loaded up here in Fremantle and then delivered up to uh, up to Benoa. So you can put your dinghies and outboards and anchors and any other junk into uh, into the container and save carrying it up on the boat. So the uh, port of Benoa has now been dredged out to uh, 14 metres and um, there's some new regulations that have come in place for temporary imports of, um, of equipment. So the two things have coincided, and it looks like we should be able to get a should be able to get a container. So hopefully that will make life a bit easier for all of the boats. So that's my update. Um, look, obviously the main topic tonight is uh, Jonathan um, talking about uh, Blue Water Electronics uh, and Eddie by Rob. Uh, I'm sure everybody in this room would know uh, would know Jonathan. Uh, and uh, so I, I won't waste any time on the introduction. I'll come straight over to him. Thanks, Bill. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm not going to use the microphone just because it's going to be going up and down too many times. So can, it, can everybody hear? Down, down there? Just? Just? Okay, I'll try and shout then. If that's okay. Um, just because I'm picking stuff up and moving. So. If not, there are seats up the front for if anybody's down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, tonight, guys, we, we're here to talk about communications. I'm not sure, it, like, some people have already asked about electronics and wind gear and instruments and all that. Look, that, that is a whole other topic in, it, in itself. So, if anybody's got any particular questions on that, we'll just leave that to the, to the end. Or come and see me and we can, we can talk about that. Um, tonight, we're going to just focus on communications for the Bali race, basically, and and a bit of stuff that's going to happen for up and down the coast that we all do here here now. So we're going to start um, pretty much at the low end, like VHF radios, just an explanation how to use them, what to do. So we'll, we'll start off with that. Um, if there's any questions, we might hold it to the end. Sometimes with this stuff, it can get pretty complicated, and it will. There's a lot to talk about. And it'll we'll, we'll be it'll be night if we're not careful. Um, so if you can hold all the questions, just come and see us at the end, um, and, and we'll sort that out. So yeah. So this is basically what we're going to talk about from step communication basic, what it's what it's all about. Um, then we'll go into VHF, HF. I know there's it, it's really open ended with the HF radios at the moment, whether they're going to stay, whether they're going to go whether you guys are using for Bali race, if the race guys have to have it, if the cruising guys don't. So I think that's all a bit over in, and so we'll, we'll still talk about it. Uh, we won't go crazy into it, but we'll still talk about it. Um, then we'll talk about the uh, mobile phone network, so 4G, where it's all going, the big 5G, if that's happening, and how that will affect all of us, and, and sort of the capability and everything of all of that. A bit about Wi-Fi and then satellite networks and all that type of stuff for you guys and if it all ends up on satellite for the Bali race, what the best option is going to be for you guys or and which, which way you want to go with it all. Um, so we'll get straight in. Um, so basically, most of the stuff, we all revolve around the radio spectrum. Some people might not and some don't. As, as bodies, we pretty much stay from HF. Um, up to the VHF range, um, so which is about three, two, two megs all the way up to about 200, 156. So that's where we sit in it. So, and then oh, we actually do end up in the mobile phone range and stuff. So e each of these sort of zones has their little niches, and you, you need to focus on like the cable types and the units and the hardware, and it all changes. What, what you're trying to do from say a HF radio to a VHF to try and get mobile phone and then getting up to like satellite communications. They all have their different abilities of doing stuff and hardware and everything. So we'll talk about each of them as we go through. But this is just an understanding of sort of how, how it all works as, as, a, as a place sitting in a spectrum, if 
you sort of understand and we get up to sort of x-rays and, and stuff like that but that really can get very complicated but it's just an understanding of that that is sort of what happens and then we'll go straight into the VHF so we've all got a VHF on our boat everybody uses it we start off with a typical handheld VHF radio so this one is a DSC capable one um, so you do need an MMS on it so we'll talk about that as we go through things with these, you always see everybody on a yacht race trying to use these on the back of the boat and the race community don't hear you. And understanding these on a good day are about five watts of power. So, and you are on the back deck. So most of you guys which are cruising and racing have got your inbuilt VHF and which is antennas at the top of the mast. Makes, makes a big difference. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about that further forward. So these are really good. It is part, I think, of the Bali race to have one of these hard wired charging ability on, on board for it. So I guess you can buy these from a range of a couple of hundred bucks all the way up to one of these ones, which is, you know, five or six hundred dollars. So some of the cheaper ones, if you're all going to jump into the life raft and you need it, and the battery life is not that good, it, it can, you can get a bit in trouble. So. There, there is sometimes worth spending a little bit of money on these if you ever actually need to, to, to use them um, on that front. And so I guess the biggest thing is, is this is not a radio for, for talking long distance with and for everybody. It is short distance and good, good for just around your boat and a backup for when you all have to get off the boat for whatever reason and we'll go to Rottnest. So I guess then we'll talk about the fixed one. So you've all got VHF radios in your boat. It's part of safety for everybody here at Freo Sailing Club, even general public safety, that you need one. So if you all don't know what one is, this is this is one here. So there are different types of these. So at the moment you can buy them with DSC or without DSC. So we'll talk about a bit of um, DSC as we as we go down. Through, through VHF. So these in WA are starting to be the main principle for all our racing and cruising. We now have got lots of repeaters around Perth, so they are really good for, for Perth and doing it. So for the barley race, a lot of it will be for chit-chatting between boats on the way up. So if you guys are all within the same range as each other of VHF, there'll be a lot of that happening. Obviously around WA we use it all the time for all the offshore racing and the cruising and rot nest. So with these, the DSC function that we have in it is nobody monitors set for the set for the, the police, um, the water police. So if you do happen to push your DSC, the sea rescue groups won't actually pick it up. Their boats, some of their boats do, but they're not actively saying. Um, we receive DSC. So DSC is a function that a lot of the radios have the red button, which is the distress button. So as you're, if you get into a problem that you have any issues, you can press that button and it will transmit in the VHF range um, your position and the distress type to anybody in the VHF range. Now, that, as, as that all happens, it will automatically turn you to channel 70. And that will then, it's when you talk to people to find out where you are and what's going on. It, it really isn't, is quite open-ended at the moment in the discussions with how this actually all works in Australia. So the reason the water police are monitoring it is because they have to for container ships and what they call GMDSS. So, it, it is quite to rely on it as a safety function at the moment as a private boat it, it is most probably not the best um, but if it's all going not that well for you it, it's worth pushing it um, for it so for that to work your radio obviously needs to be as DSC capable and it needs to have a GPS fix and you have to have a MMSI number programmed into it for it to work. 
um, different models have it, so this ICOM does, so ICOM doing one below that doesn't, so you have to be aware that when you do buy VHF radio, you need to make sure that it's DSC, because I think that's pretty much what's happening for the, for the yachting here and, and also the barley race, it will make a difference. So, with these, as they're installed in your boat, one of the biggest things we find is we stick a VHF antenna at the top of your mast, one here, and what we find is the cable is, is really, really too small for it. It's what tends to happen around Perth. So with the length of most rigs, they're between 15 and 25 metres, depending on the size of the boat. So the cable that, that should be run um, for it is, is quite a thick one. And for all the race guys out there, they don't like us putting it up there. But this is this is the cable that should go up your mast, and it, and it makes a really big difference. So I think the race committee have made it aware to a few people that their radios aren't that good. Um, it will be because of this. So I'll pass it around. And have a look. Actually, I'll pass all the cable around. So what we do is just a bit of cable that we use. Um, all the different types of cable that we use. In, in your boats to try and stop noise and um, different types of signals getting into all your electronics and, and stopping them all from working. So I'll pass it around, you can always have a quick squeeze. There's a whole different types of cables, some data cable, everything in there um, for it. So, what have we got? so I guess a VHF, we, we get a lot of people that do you guys actually know how to use the VHF? And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah I've been sailing for, for 20 years. Um, so we'll, we'll just do a quick basic talk of, of, of how you should use your VHF. So first things first, you get on your plane. And channel 16 is obviously the emergency channel across the board, and that's worldwide. Um, then we have our operating channels that are there. So for Perth, um, I think we run on 82, I think, for a lot of the sailing. I can't remember, I haven't done a bit of it. Uh, and then 72? Yeah. 72, sorry. 82 is repeaters. Yeah, okay. Uh, 73, free OC rescue. So, first thing with your radio is they sit in your boat, the antennas sit up the top of the ring, they get rained on, they get salt water, and if you're very unlucky, you put them in the water. Um, so. It's always worth doing a check with your VHF. Um, we find the yachts, a good place is to do Whitford Sea Rescue, which is, um, I think it's Ocean Reef where they are, so they're, they're quite a good distance away. They seem to be a good place to do a, good, a, a test for your VHF. So, first thing, when you turn it on, you should always select your channels or make sure you're on channel 73 or who you're going to talk to. And then the best way is to Turn your squelch all the way off and then do your volume to what you want to listen to. A lot of the time, the volume might be down so you won't hear it. And then it is then to set your squelch just enough to you, you lose it. If you go too high, you won't hear anything, any weak signals that come through. And then you can back it off a little bit. So that, that is pretty much what you need to do. One of the biggest problems we find, especially with VHFs, is this button here, the high-low mic, um, high-low power. So ICOMs have got it, I'm not sure who else has got it, but a lot of the time when we get our phone calls, oh, my VHF didn't work in the race, and you go down the boat, and the radio is, is on one watt. So the max power of a VHF is 20, 25 watts. So one of the biggest things we find is that people have accidentally pressed that button and they're just sitting on one watt and, and actually not getting anywhere with it. Um, so that's, that's a big thing. Every single radio is a little bit different. They all have a heap of extra functions in them. Um, it is radio specific, so I can't really go through them. The only one thing I will say is that the DSC Select calling, you can put your friend's uh, MMSI number in and you can call them. So, but that won't happen because everybody will be monitoring their radios going to Bali. Um, 
Um, so you can do group calling, you can know your friends, and you can call them, and the radio will go off at, at, as loud as it can, and then you go down and pick, pick your radio up. So your MMSI number is, is what's issued to all the boats. Obviously, you have to register them for it with AMSA, but it is a number that identifies your boat as a Pacific boat. Once that boat and hull number has been issued an MMSI number, it's not movable to the next boat. So every time you buy a boat or you sell a boat, it will always stay with it. It's like a call sign as well that you get issued by AMSA. Um, call signs, like it was quite a traditional thing for all the yachts to have then. It's not so much now. Um, it's sort of faded. In the, in the commercial place it is call signs. Now we only tend to see it on the older yachts where it's quite traditional to have your call sign, but you, you're still more than welcome of getting one um, for, I think, I think maybe for the barley race, I think it was at one stage you needed, I'm not sure if this is the same this year, but you needed like IO numbers on the bow, and then you did need a call sign, I'm not sure if Steve will, somebody might be able to help us with that, no, okay. Um, so that is issued to the boat, so that's programmed into all your radio, so if you have an icon or it's VHF, it's programmed into here. It's programmed into your AIS unit, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and it's programmed into your handheld VHF, if you have one. And it's also programmed into your man overboard beacons, if you've got the models that, that take them. Um, so basically, when any of this stuff goes off, that number, is registered to your boat and everybody can see it. Next to Kings can be called and everything sort of um, assigned to it, a bit like call sign. So that's that's an MMSI number. Um, so BHF channels, I didn't know them. Um, 16, obviously the safety channel for around here. Um, 73, Fair Sea Rescue. Channel 12, Fremantle Port, we really don't need to do too much of that. Channel 70 is that DSC. So if you guys ever do push the DSC button, if for whatever reason, or somebody else presses it, the radios, and you need to be aware of this, some radios will, if they receive a DSC message, for somebody pressing it, I think we've all most probably seen it on a VHF at some point. If, you, if you're out there, sometimes your radio can flip to 70 and you won't know. So if you're out yacht racing, you're doing the barley race, one of these goes off, you need to make sure that your radio has gone back to the channels that you're operating on. So that's just a, you don't see it that often at the moment, just because DSC is still quite fresh in. Um, repeater channels, we've all started using these. 80 Cape Naturalist, 82 Mandra, 81 Rotnest. For the barley race, most probably, maybe I think there's some up north. I'd have to actually, I think there's one X mouth this way that could possibly be used. Oh, yeah, it's not loud enough. Yeah. Test, test, test. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Can remember that? Sorry. Um, Alright, so, and 81 right on this island. Look, you guys are all sailing the barley, so they, they're not going <laughs> to, you're going to get away from right pretty quick. Um, these repeaters are pretty good, so. We've all um, done the Albany race, so the guys that did have good VHF radios um, had really good reception the whole way down, I'm pretty sure, from, from what the race committee had, had said to us. The guys that had some uh, bad cabling um, didn't, didn't quite get there um, with it. Uh, we'll move on to AIS now, pretty quick. So, AIS, this is really, really starting to get really good in the marine industry. Um, this is obviously uh, up in England, in the channel, and, and this is how busy it can get with the AIS units. So, AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. So it's a VHF based system that a lot of you might, might not have yet, a lot of you do, and I think it's mandatory for the barley race this year. So. It's coming mandatory across the board in yacht racing and basically general cruising, it is a really good idea. So all container ships will have this. So 
they have a, have a ability of coming up over the horizon at night and you don't see them. So if you have this, they will see you and you can see them. So with it. It is, it is on a VHF range, so it operates above the talking VHF channels. Um, so nothing will interfere with anything. But you have to remember that the range is, is still a VHF range of this. So the satellites are receiving AIS as well. Um, in some places there are AIS repeaters. I don't know of any in, in, in Australia. Um, but there may be, I'm not sure. I know there are some up in Europe. So you have to be aware that this is VHF coverage. So when we install this in your boat, we'll actually use, um, we have one here, AIS unit, and an antenna splitter. So what we do is we run the AIS off your masthead VHF antenna. So we get the height, and if you run a good cable up the rig, you, you will get out to 20, 30 miles um, with it. Container ships, their antennas are really high. And with AIS, I think I have a page for this. Oh, no, I don't actually. Um, with the AIS, there's like three types of them. So when you guys, if you haven't got one on your boat already, you have to be like really careful because there's three types. One's really expensive, one's okay, and one's really cheap but not the right one. So. So it basically is a class A, B, and C AIS units. So we'll start at the bottom, which is class C. So they're a receive only unit. So we will plug them into your VHF antenna. Then we can integrate it with your chart plotter or your laptop. And then you'll, you'll get a picture of all the boats that are around you. With class C, you will not transmit your position. <coughs> so I think for Bali, it is a class B. Um, Compliant for, for the Bali race. So a class B is, is a transceiver, so it transmits and receives. So it will transmit your position, your boat speed, and what type of vessel you are. Now, with this, we get a lot of questions, people asking loved ones at home, I can't see you on the AIS live internet trackers. Sometimes they don't have enough horsepower to get to the satellites. All the stuff on the internet is done by volunteers with little Class C IISs all printed around the coast of all the places around the world. So that is why sometimes if you, if you have seen it and you're like, oh, where have they gone? It's, it's A, you're only on VHF, and B, there might not be a receiver on the shore anywhere. You can... The live trackers on the satellites via the internet, that is a paid subscription on internet, so you can, you can see them. Sometimes the Class B ones um, a, a little bit tricky. So a Class B, just it, it's transmitting at two watts, so it really isn't that powerful. So compared to your VHF that is 20, 25 watts, so that is part of the distance. They do that to try and stop the cluttering, there is eventually that the way that I won't get into the nitty gritty of how AIS works, but it, it eventually can fill up and stop. Um, so then there's the class A ones. So that they have about a 15 to 20 nautical mile range, um, and they're what you see on container ships and, and any big ships that are, that are coming your way. So they, they are what you really don't want to avoid and this is where this system is, is really good for it. So they will, they will have priority over the AI spectrum, or Class A ones. So we have seen a couple of problems. Um, Sydney Harbour is one, and we just saw it recently with a boat, a couple of guys coming back through Singapore, is some of the Class A IIS units, we, might, we won't see it in the Bali range, I wouldn't have thought, but if there's any guys that are sort of going further once they've done the barley race, this could be this could be a problem for you. Is that some of the class B's will overload? So, for example, in this picture, some of the class B's with too many targets will actually start to, to overload and stop working, and 
that obviously is not good because the whole idea of it is that you're in a congested area and you want to see all these boats. So it's just one thing to be aware if when you do purchase or you're buying an AIS unit that um, it possibly could stop if you're in heavy traffic areas. So I know at the beginning of big yacht races and everybody's in the one marina, you, you can get the ability of all these phone calls going, my IAS has stopped working like half an hour before the race. And it's, it's everybody just turning them all on and it just all getting clogged in one section. Um, so MMSI number, again, this gets programmed into your AIS. With this, we program it in, or you guys can program it in if you guys are game. One thing you have to be aware of is when you program AIS units, is that once the MMSI number goes in, they're really hard to get out. They're really hard for us to get out. Um, we almost have to send them back to the manufacturer for them to remove the MMSI number. So if you think you want to take your AIS unit from another boat to another boat, think twice. It is, it is really hard to change the MMSI numbers. So we've had a, had a few people in their times done it, just missed a number or got it wrong. It, um, yeah, it gets really hard from there. So a lot of them will ask you to enter it twice. And so is this actually same with the radios. So these are also really hard to get out once you've programmed it. So you have to be really careful that you've got your right MMSI number going into the AIS, AIS system um, for it all. So that's pretty much what it is. I mean, there's not too much more to it. it. It can get a bit complicated when it comes time to start interfacing it. So depending on your boats and how old your chart plotters are, if you have them, are you running laptops, that type of stuff, how are we going to see all this? Um, some AIS units have their own screens, but nowadays a lot of them are all little black box units um, with them. One thing you do have to take into consider is that all Class B AIS need their own GPS antenna. Um, the way it all works is they work off the fact that they have really accurate time to slot everybody into the time gap. So there's nobody managing that AIS system. It is self-managed from unit to unit, so, and they use, I can't remember what it's called, but they use a very specific timing on each unit, and that's how you get your little transmit time, and you slot in. So just be aware that there will be a GPS that has to go on your boat. So we have seen it where people have gone, oh, it's only the AIS GPS antenna. We will just stick it under the gunnel in the boat, in behind the nav station. Um, we have seen that cause lots of problems with it. Please don't do that. Put it on the back rail where it can see all the sky um, for it. Otherwise, it will cause problems with it. Um, so anyway, we'll move on. The next one, this is seeming to be a hot topic in Perth, especially at Perth Sailing Club at the moment. So I think Bill and last offshore race, they did a test on AIS man overboards um, beacons. So. I think this is also mandatory for the bay race. Yep. So if you guys haven't seen this, it's these uh, little units, this big, and they have been um, got quite small now. Um, in there, they have been mandatory in Europe yacht racing for a long time now um, because they are quite good if you do fall overboard um, with them. So these are running off the AIS system as well. So if you do go in the water, these get set off and they transmit on AIS. They will get a GPS fix and then you will show up on the chart plotter, on the boat or the laptop. What we found with these after Bill's testing, and we did a lot of testing of these a few, few years ago um, for more of a, of a boat speed point, not so much of a, uh, an equipment point. After Bill's testing, we, we found, or they found that um, everybody didn't quite know what was going on on their boat. So there are a lot of different types of these that come out. So we've got, um, this is the Rescue Me one, and then the R10 Safe Link is another different brand. So 
what we've basically found is with, with these branding is a lot of them have a whole heap of different features and different functions and how they get set off and how they get used. So we're I'm sort of trying to work it all out ourselves on what, what is a good a good one um, with, with, with them all. Um, Um, some of them also have the DSC function that we talked about in the VHF um, ability with this to set these off. Now, I know if you guys are involved in that Freo Sailing Club test, it was asked whether your radios would go off. Every single different type of these have a different function. Some of them are AIS only, some of them are AIS and DSC, some of them will always transmit a DSC distress call and an AIS call to everybody as you set off like the one that happened at Freo. This one here, the Rescue Me, will only set off an AIS distress target and it will set off a DSC target if it's programmed with your MMSI number. It is a function of pressing a button if you're in the water to transmit it to a broadcast of all ships on DSC to set everybody's radio off. So when it comes buying these, and you're gonna, I guess it's all gonna be up to how it works, whether your boat owner is gonna buy them all as a crew set or whether you're gonna buy them individually. So my, my recommendation is to owners, is most probably to buy them as a boat set, if, if you guys can. Um, where it goes from here is that as it gets set off, every single boat and electronics is seeming to be different. So when these first came around, nobody could make any sense of what should happen. And all the chart plotters and computer systems didn't really have any idea of what needed to be done for them. So your electronics and your chart plotters and computers and radio, depending on the age of them, may not even receive it, may receive it in a funny way as we found out out of the test and and possibly not even receive it all. So when it comes time to purchase these things, um, it's really important to work out what you actually want. So that is why I suggest that the owner should, should try and make sure that either they buy them all for the crew or that for the barley race they, you make sure your crew buy the one that you want um, as, you, as it works. So what we found with the testing um, is that as, as they go off, most of the time, if there's programmed or the DC ones, we'll set your VHF radio off pretty much straight away within 20 to 30 seconds is, is what we found. The AIS will take a lot longer. So it will take up to a minute or so to get a GPS fix and then set off, set off the AIS beacon um, for them. Uh, and then the next thing is the chart plotters and the AIS system. So now basically with the newer stuff like we've got set up here, um, we'll do a bit of testing. I think we'll leave it till the end of the night. So if you're interested in, we'll set a couple off and you can see for the guys that did the testing. I think it'll be a bit time consuming now to sort of do it. But, um, a lot of the time everybody doesn't know what actually you need to do when they go off um, or whether your hardware on your boat can actually receive it. So the worst thing is is you get your crew and you all go sailing and somebody falls overboard, you set this off and nothing goes off in your boat and uh oh, problems. Um, so it is definitely worth testing these units with your boat. If Setting them off, as Bill found, the water police can actually receive them, um, which they didn't know, I don't think. <laughs> well, they were, they were notified, but they weren't interested until it went off. So, yeah. <laughs> Too many donuts. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, early on in the piece with the old char plotters, when they were set off, some of them didn't do anything, some of them did do something, and some of them didn't do it. So, it is chart plot of Pacific to how this is and it still is this way. So we had an incident with a boat coming back down through 
down the side of Malaysia and Singapore and the char plotter was going off because the local fishermen were strapping these things to their fishing nets and just leaving them on. We had incidents of the Garmin char plotter. I don't want to bag name stuff, but you couldn't turn it off. So every time they went there, every time, every five minutes, they would have to clear the beep on their char plotter all the way down the Malaysian coast. So <laughs> It dropped, like the phone calls were like, is there any way to stop this? And I was ringing Garmin, going through their manuals, and it, there was just nothing in the, in the software to, to do it. So the guy was like, help, stop the beep. Um, eventually he got away from there and it, all, and it all stopped. That was actually, I was even, that was my first time I experienced that stuff, and I thought it was a problem with the system, but it wasn't, it was just fishermen. Um, I guess they didn't hit their nets, so it worked out for them. Um, same boat had problems with overloading on their AIS system as well. But with the char plotters, that is the number one thing that you need to test with these things. And I don't know if it's mandatory for the barley race for a safety guy to check, or you do test with them. I'm not sure how that's all going to work yet. Um, peace of mind for all the owners, I would do this a lot of time. It is one of those things as a boat owner that you just don't want to go through, I don't think. Um, so make sure the batteries are good. Every single one of these will have some sort of procedure to test batteries and they will have a procedure not to transmit to the open well, but enough, they'll do a little burst to test your system on the boat just to make sure that your chart plotter will pick them up. Um, and your, and your radios. So, a lot of guys in the racing time, I know it doesn't seem to happen down here, but up in the Europe's, I just did the fast dance race, and everybody would test these and their chart plotters before the race, um, because they don't, you don't carry um, personal e verbs up there, it's only AIS units. So, I know a lot of the boats test them all before every race and make sure they're system. So, a lot of boats, for example, well, that are going to Bali may not, I don't know if a chart plotter is mandatory for the Bali race, I'm not, I'm not sure. So a lot, of, a lot of guys might just have a computer system. Um, if you all know computers on boats, they tend to break a lot. Um, so another awareness that if you, if you are running this whole system off computers and you're relying on a computer or just latitude and longitude to find, find somebody without a chart plotter, you, it, it, get, it can get a bit tricky. A lot of chart plotters will give you bearing to waypoint or bearing to man overboard um, with them. We already noticed tonight, we did a test before it, that it actually didn't, it put us 150 metres away here. It was from the, from the, from the balcony. Um, it might have been the balcony causing the problem, but, or it could be the fact that the GPSs in these are not the same GPS as what you've got in your, in your chart plotter. They're not 12 channel, they're, they're quite small. So you have to be aware that if, if you do go over and you do set it off, you possibly won't be in the same, same location as it says. So it's something to be aware of. But it'll, it'll hone, you, hone the guys in pretty quick with it. So, Yeah, exactly, waving. <laughs> Hello, I'm here. <laughs> um, most of them have got a light attached to them. Um, it's not a very big light, so I wouldn't rely on this as your life jacket light at night to flash to somebody. I would have a bigger torch or something in there. So I guess, just a quick reaction, the chart plotter and how it works is super important because some of them, like the Garmin chart plotter, will automatically pull up the man overboard point and do a direct point to them where the B and G one will come up and ask a screen whether you want to clear it and this is to manage all these type of like fishing AIS units that are going off around the world, the fishermen. So some of them will ask you to clear it whether you want to go to it. So you guys have to be Especially navigators, most of the time it's going to be the navigators looking at it, unless they go overboard, then there should be somebody that's really good at backing that up, not at all. Um, not at all. 
So I guess the next thing is with these, wearing them. Now, they really need to be in your life jacket. Um, a lot of people here are just shoving them in or having them in bum bags. Now, a lot of the time you don't fall, you fall overboard and you're not conscious and you're in so much shock that you don't know what to do like when it all happens. So I'm not sure how the regulations here work, but I know in Europe these must be attached to your life jacket and they must be able to be activated as the life jacket inflates. So there, there is definitely a couple of different models here. So um, this is Marco's one and a lot of them all come with the clip to clip to your to your breathable uh, life jacket blower, you wrap the string around your life jacket and tie it back to itself. So as the life jacket inflates, it pulls the pin. This one, for example, has the feeling that that will actually do that. But as Steve and I had a look before, it, it doesn't do it. You still have it pops one, and then you have to then manually pop the next one. Um, so yeah, not not a good one, Steve. <laughs> um, this one here, the Rescue Me, this seems to be the go-to at the moment um, for everybody. It has, um, as soon as the life jacket inflates, it comes with a clip to clip it to your thing. As soon as the life jacket inflates, it pulls it and pops it. One thing, these don't work underwater. So if you do fall overboard and the antenna starts hitting water, um, it, it's going to not work that well. So by having it attached to your tube, inflation tube on your life jacket, you tend to all float like this, and it's going to be the best best you can get it. Um, if not, if you're still conscious, hold it up in the air. What, what we found with these is a lot of the testing um, <laughs> is saying that the units all are pretty good three to five kilometer miles. We, we found in the, the testing we did a few years ago is that diminishes real quickly in rough in rough weather. Um, so a lot of the guys, um, we, we did that testing because it was on a really fast boat and we were trying to work out how long you actually had before the signal signal lost. Um, so this does not replace the man overboard button on your GPSs. If somebody does go overboard, and I don't know if this is uh, for Bali Race, I know for Hobart you have to have a, an installed button up on the deck for man overboard near the drivers. Um, I don't know if this is a regulation from Bali racing guys, not sure. May, may be happening, don't know. But man overboard buttons still need to be pressed because if you are on a fast boat and you sail out of the range of this, you, you want to at least get back to the man overboard and hopefully it's all happened quick enough that this has been set off or somebody's worked it out, their life jacket's inflated and the GPS has already got a ping on it and, and you sort of got it. But you just need to be aware um, that if you are on a race boat going fast, that it, you still need to do stuff pretty quick to get back to the guys um, that, that go overboard. Um, it's, yeah, you don't really want it to happen. Um, that was basically the limitations with them. So you, you do need to be aware of, of, of the limitations of them because they're not, just a simple, oh yeah, I'll strap this, I'll put it in my pocket, and oh boy, I go, and I'll set it off and I'll come and get me. So that is, is, is them. Um, we, we'll have questions, because I think this is a pretty serious topic for the Bali race coming, coming up, and I think, I think you guys are still trying to work out how to sort of police it or try and make sure that everybody has, has their systems up, up and working. Most of the new stuff, if you've got newish bones, and, and stuff like this, it, it's going to be really straightforward. If you have some older chart plotters and AIS units, it, it will be either software upgrades for them to work properly um, for, for, for most of them. Um, and if they're really old, well, it might be time to send me <laughs> to, to, sort, to sort it out. Um, so, So we'll move on now. Um, so yeah, any questions about these, come come see us. And then I think Bill's got planned some next testing for the next offshore race to um, just try and hone in a few of the problems. I think we had the 
crush guys, didn't know how to use their chart plotter. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, some didn't have their computer working properly, Bill. Um, and I guess some of the VHFs went off. One thing you've got to be aware with the VHFs is they have really tiny screens. So I think in the last test, people were like, oh yeah, we saw the, the number come up, um, but we didn't, we didn't know where they were. So the chances are, it's because the screen's so small, you'll have to scroll down in the VHF to see the latitude and longitude of the, of the PLB that's going on, uh, the certain amount of overboard beacon that's going on. So that is also contributing to your VHF with it. So another one to be sure. If I don't know what the ruling is, whether you guys have to have chart plotters or you're allowed to rely on a, so AIS VHF. Some of the new VHF have inbuilt AIS. Um, so I don't, I don't know how all that ruling is going to unfold just yet, but I'm sure we'll work it out in the next coming. Um, all right, let's move on. Um, HF radios. Um, I guess this is a this is definitely an interesting topic lately around town. Um, We've all known them, and we've all had them, and we've all had massive problems with them <laughs> in, in offshore racing and, and cruising and previous barley races. So, look, we're going to cover it. We're not sure, I think, whether the racing guys have got them or the cruising guys have to have them. We're just going to cover it. A lot of guys have actually got them still on their boats, and a lot of them... Um, I don't actually don't think there's any yacht races in Perth now that you actually still need them. As such, I think it's all gone sat phone. Um, and I think barley race pending. Is that correct, Will? Yeah. Um, Hobart race. If you're going to do a Hobart race, they are pretty thick on this. They, they, they're not going anywhere anytime soon with getting away with not having one of these. Um, so we'll do a bit, little bit quick talk about them. Um, they sit right at the bottom underneath VHF, 2 to 30 megahertz. Um, might not make any sense, but this is how they get the distance out of them. So, HF radio is designed for long distances, like really long distances. So you can you can get one of these and a good setup to do a whole lap of the world, and almost talk back to yourself if 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 you've got it set up and you've got the right channels. So, just a quick understanding of how these work. They have the antennas at the back of your box. I actually did bring one. They're like the big long ones that you see on power boats, or some of the yachts have really big long ones out the back, or they go up your back stay um, with them. These guys use the bounce effect off what we call the ionospheres up in, in the outer layer of space, just, just outside. Um, I actually don't know how far they are, but there's, there's, there's about three or four of them, I think. And the, the idea behind it is that you can transmit off your antenna and bounce off the ionosphere and come back down again. So it's a bit of a funny concept to get to get your head around. But the the channels and the frequencies in, in HF are really different to VHF um, types. So you've all most probably played with an ICOM HF radio and you get completely lost in trying to find the right channels. Um, so the the um, with these ionospheres, the frequencies that you use, which are the channels in the radio, have the ability to pass ionospheres. So as, if you say you have a 2 meg channel um, in, in the radio, it will hit the first ionosphere and then bounce back down again. Now, if you're sort of underneath neath that, you won't get, you can't talk to that person. Um, Usually, two meg channels is about a one bounce, or it's a ground wave. So we call a ground wave, which is VHF, um, UHF stuff like that. We call a sky wave. HF is what bounces off the ionospheres. So that is because it all happens because we're right down in this low frequency. So VHF just punches straight through ionospheres, and that's like what NASA use. They use VHF to talk to satellites and all sorts of stuff. Um, when you go up to the next channel, say a 4 meg channel, which we operate for racing, you then can bounce to the next ionosphere, which is higher in the atmosphere, that gives you a further distance around the globe, if you sort of grasp it, then again and again as you keep going. So we tend to break it up. Uh, is this? So like the safety channels, for example, we have a 4 meg channel, 
six meg channel, an eight meg channel, that, and they, they actually go up to 12 and, and all of that. So what you have to be aware of with HF is you can get a distant, but you really need to know how they work um, for, for, for the, to get the distance. So you can skip your target um, and go straight over the top of them if you're not careful. Um, so you just, you just need to be aware of that. The next thing is HF radios are not a simple installation. They rely on your backstay or your big bong with antenna to use the water as the what we call the ground plane. So the earthing, we've all seen one of these. This is an auto tuner for the antenna because the bandwidth of a HF radio is so big, we, we can't actually tune um, the antenna antenna for it. It needs to be tuned individually for every frequency um, for it all. Uh, so the ground plane is the earth plate and everybody talks about them. Some people never want to put them in their race boats because they'd rather bolt to the keel or this or that. What we found, earth plates, if you put them in and you wire the radio good, they, you tend to have no problems. Our other biggest problem is these draw a lot of power off your boat. So if you are sailing, say the barley race, and you've been running for six, 12 hours on your batteries, um, these need 13 volts like to really transmit, um, to get the power out. So it's always best to make sure that you're charging or you've charged just before a radio scared or what you need to use. Now, HF and using HF is one of the biggest things. We have seen it. I've been told by countless people, don't tell me, I've been telling them 50 years, I know how to use them. Um, I mentioned names. Um, This is a HF radio, an Icon one. That's where we all send them. With the HF radios, as you change frequencies, I had one with a Hobart boat where I went and tested the radio for the Hobart and I went up to some really big frequencies and did not put it back to the Perth race frequency. Um, the guys went and used the boat, did the Geraldton race, I think it was, and I got some pretty not very nice phone calls at the end of the Geraldton race. Um, it turned out to be that the navigator hadn't tuned the radio. So unlike VHF, you cannot just change the channel on these and pull the trigger and talk to somebody. Um, you need to make sure that you tune the antenna tuner. The antenna tuner has a whole heap of electronics in it that tunes the length of the wire or the antenna to the frequency that you're running on. So what we found is icon, that's the tune button. So for a radio skid, lots of power, and make sure that you're on the right frequency and that you hit the tune button. And don't assume that it is tuned. So before every time you pull the radio, like I hit this tune button about three times before I do a radio skid make sure that, it, that it's working um, properly. A lot, of the, a lot of the radios are different. Um, I don't know if you remember the old coat, big black Kodan ones with three, three knobs and you'd have to like manually tune them to the light grew brighter. Um, I think they're even older than me. Um, same sort of thing. So a lot of them will tell you whether it's tuned or not. Um, so one big thing that a lot of people forget to hit the tune button. and do it before every radio skid. The next thing is, these are voice modulated. So, a VHF radio, when you talk into it, the volume that comes out the other end is the same volume as you put into it. With these, the horsepower that these get put out the antenna is to how loud you talk into them. So. If you are quick and you whisper into a HF radio, you will not get the power out of them. So, if you're having problems getting communications with a HF radio, a lot of the time, it is power, 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 earth problem, 
or it can be the fact that people are just not talking into them loud enough. Um, so if you are having problems doing your radio schedule talking to people, yell down them and the power of your radio goes up. Uh, so another one, sometimes the girls are a bit hard to hear. Um, so try and yell down them. Um, if it, so if they do end up in the barley race, um, that's one of the big, big tricks. I think the last few barley races we had all sorts of problems. I think it was good when we were doing Wilena. Um, good, I think the first barley race it was catastrophe. That sounds like, yeah. Um, if you go to Hobart, if any of you guys are doing Hobart this year before it, these are mandatory. Their system for all these is really regulated and really set up and their system works quite well. Um, they have a boat that follows the fleet to Hobart, um, so you don't ever have to change frequency and that's how they've made the key to it all working pretty good. If, if they were actually having to change frequency, I think we would have had the first part, you'd have the first barley race of people getting lost and not being able to get talked to. Um, there is ways of doing skids with the different frequencies, but I don't think it's not we won't go into it. No, I don't think I don't think it'll be in the race. Anyway, but um, that's that's HF. Um, if you have any questions about this and them, if you're cruising, there are all sorts of options for getting weather and stuff through them, but it's all pretty pretty technical. Anyway, right, so we'll, we'll keep moving on. Um, next is mobile mobile networks. Um, this has been a really interesting um, topic in the last few years in, in Australia. Um, we've, in, in Perth, for the barley race, I think you might get quite a bit of this um, on the way up the coast, depending on, on what happens. Uh, maybe a little bit. I think a lot of you guys have already got systems on place in, in the boats um, with it. So, phones, smartphones, um, Terminals and repeaters. So we were putting illegal terminals in um, at one stage to boost the mobile phone signals. Um, now we don't have to use them. Telstra have released what we call a cell fire booster um, for the mobile phones um, and also terminals. So terminals uh, have a SIM card in them, they're like a mobile phone. They create a, white, a hot spot on your boat or we connect them into your network depending on how complicated it is. Um, this has been really interesting. So we all started off on 3G. 3G was really good for us um, just because of where it ended up in that frequency spectrum. It was quite um, low. So it worked really well. We got lots of distance out of it. Like we were having boats out at 20, 30, 40 miles on a good night um, getting mobile phone coverage. We then went to 4G and that was a um, big disaster. It went up to like a gigahertz and suddenly it, like getting your mobile phone coverage out at sea um, it was re really hard. And funny enough, Telstra don't point their towers out at sea for us um, to get it. So we then, they introduced the cell fire boosters. So one thing you have to be careful with these is they are, um, Carrier Pacific, so if you are an Optus user, we don't use Optus anyway because they don't have the coverage out at sea, so always use Telstra uh, if you're out at sea and doing yacht races and you want the best 4G coverage, um, Telstra. Optus actually do have some towers, if you guys go Kimberley for whatever reason, I hope you don't want to pull in there, uh, you might want to go there if it's a bit yuck. Um, they do have an office tower, so a lot of guys will, but you're so close. And it's only a 2G office tower right there, so it's not that good. Um, so with, with these, we, we get all sorts of questions about these, these boosters. Can I have my antenna at the top of my mast? Can I have it down here? With these frequencies that these operate, what we've found is that if we put your antenna at the top of the mast, the cable loss coming down the rig is too high for them. Um, you'll find, and it, and it just doesn't work. So we've, we've got a couple of boats out here um, that persisted on trying it. Um, look, we've had some good good, good answers from them, but I think for, for what it's worth, putting them on your back rail, um, minimising that cable run is, is, a, is a big thing. So basically what we are 
basically doing now is installing a cell fire booster in the back of the boat for everybody we put on. We actually use um, a full drive antenna. Uh, we were using hard antennas, but we found that people that like drag dragging their spinnakers out the back of the boat <laughs> were um, snapping them off. Um, so we put them on full drive springs. So if that does happen or running back stays and everything um, can sort of fl flick off them. Uh, then we typically have a, a, a terminal or um, some sort of box. These things at the moment, there's a new one coming out every four weeks just about. So like they're changing all the time to try and keep up, to keep, to keep up with them all. So a lot of guys asked why. Um, most of the time it is guys having computers and stuff like that, wanting grips and weather files and internet. We always find it's better plugging a cable directly into one of them and into your laptop um, for it. We found that we're doing like um, personal hotspot off your phone gets a bit hard in there to do it. So we always recommend putting a proper grade unit in. Now, when, when you do go to buy these, they uh, they get put into categories. Um, of how, how fast and how good they are. So the reason they do that is because a lot of these sort of type of terminals are used for what I call B2B um, stuff. So people, we get a lot of problems where people go, oh, I bought this thing off the internet for super cheap and the, the and they're a B2B solution. So they're only ever to be made to be put on top of like, um, say like the, um, traffic lights and transmit that they're not working back to somebody and they're at a really low category, category two or something, and the internet speed is like lower than dial up. Um, so you've got to be aware of that. So, and they go all the way up to a cat six. So you'll find that some guys will be like, oh, my mobile phone like, is getting lots of data. Why isn't my boat getting it? And the chances are it could be because they've actually limited the, the unit or the selling point of them, so you just have to be aware of that when you do when you do buy them. But if you're chasing uh, like lots of data, so I know a lot of guys now that go to Rockness, for example, for Bios, you know they want to stream music and TV and all that through them. Um, you, you need to make sure that you've got a, a big, a high category one uh, to make sure that you get delivered the bandwidth for them. Um, communication distance of them. It, Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, nah, all good, it always works in Perth. That is really not the case. And I think you most probably all know that if you've sailed around. You do run out of um, phone reception out there, even with the boosters. They're not actually a booster, they're more of a repeater. Um, and you can't boost or repeat nothing. So if you're outside of the signal, you've run, yeah, no chance time to turn the sat phone on. Um, so if, if you are, thinking that you're going to get reception all the way down to, say, Cape Naturalist. Um, we had a few boats a few years ago that thought they lost their race because they ran out of internet. Yeah. All right, so we'll finish up on that. That, if you've got any questions about that stuff, it, it is like really specific to your boat and what you guys want to do. And it literally, every six months, there's a, there's a new product. So it, it just keeps going and going and going. The 5G stuff that Telstra is talking about, um, that's coming for all this stuff. We, we don't have any idea of where that's going yet. It's looking like the frequency is gonna be really high, so it's actually most probably not gonna be that crash hot for our last boaties. Um, so we'll wait and, wait and see with that, with that side of it. Uh, all right, moving on. Um, Wi-Fi, so I guess this is happening more and more now. Um, for, for the boats, um, especially if you guys have got new chart plotters, um, anything from Rain Rain, BNG, Simrad, uh, not sure about Garmin, um, but they all can remote desktop um, to your iPads. Um, I think everybody's just about got an iPad. So if you guys are looking for a reasonably good solution um, to having a chart plotter downstairs and having an on deck screen, and you don't want to go down the path of having laptops and remote desktop and all of that, uh, Wi Fi from the chart plotters can be quite good. And most of them now, all it is is an app. 
and you get Jar Potter up on the screen. With it, um, Marina Wi-Fi, I mean, it's not really a big thing yet in Australia, uh, the US and all that it is, and, and long distance Wi-Fi. A lot of the, uh, I think actually through Asia there is quite a lot of big high distance Wi-Fi stuff. Um, I haven't had much to do with it yet, um, so, but it, it is out there um, for it, so it, it really is not in Australia, I don't know too much about the big marina Wi-Fi's um, for it. When we do do um, all this wi stuff with computers and internet, it, it, you always have to be careful, especially when sat phones are involved with it, um, and carbon race boats, if anybody's got any carbon race boats, Wi-Fi just disappears on carbon boats. Uh, so. You, you have to have like systems and antennas and all, all sorts of extra stuff to make it work on, your, on, a, on a carbon boat. So just be aware of, aware of that type of stuff if you're trying to do chart plotters and that downstairs. Uh, that, that's all pretty, we'll, we'll leave that. We don't need to go any further on that. Uh, right, satellite phones. So I reckon this is a bit of, bit of a big hot topic um, for the Bali race uh, with, with all of this. Um, so I guess everybody with satellite phones, handhelds, Iridium goes, fleet ones, all experience them either not working or getting a bill that you can't jump over from them. Um, we've seen bills that are through the roof. We've been in the middle of trying to sort them out and it's, yeah, it's not pretty. So one of the biggest things with, with all this satellite communication stuff is you need to know exactly what you've bought. Um, we have had big problems where we sit down with you guys and be like, hey, you need to listen to me. This will cost you a lot of money if you're not careful. Sometimes it goes in one ear and straight out the other and it gets messy. So with, with all of this, you have to be really, really careful and that's one of my biggest things with this stuff. Um, so but we'll, we'll go through a bit of this and um, Rob will talk a bit about the Iridium goes and, and stuff as we go through for you. Um, so I guess types of satellites, um, communication systems. So we obviously all know the Iridium handheld phones, we've all seen them, um, or most probably used them. We then have, uh, go back to that one. Then we have the ISAP phones, which is another handheld one that we see. Then we have these these big antennas as well that you've seen on everybody's on a few boats. Um, I don't know if you see how these all work, but they track the satellite in the sky um, continuously as you're sailing along. Um, here's, here's another one um, that does it, and then there's antennas that look like this as well. Um, the market for all this stuff is huge. There is there is a lot of it online, and it, and it is really a minefield when it comes to trying to work out what you guys want and what you want to do for for the Bali race. Um, I guess the ruling of systems is is not sort of in place yet, so I guess we'll find out um, what mo moves forward with, with that side of it. Um, onto it. What I'll go through. So sat phone safety. We've all seen and. See what happened to these guys? Um, yeah, well, not, a, not a good day for them. Um, so, sat phones play a big part in this, especially Bali race. You guys are crossing a big ditch there. Um, so, it, it is really important when it comes time to try and work out what unit you want, whether it's a Iridium Go or a handheld, all this. Um, handheld satellite phones, um, if you've all tried one, they actually are quite hard to use on land to get a good signal if you've all, all tried one. It is a big time that if you need to get out your handheld satellite phone and you're in 30 knots and there's water coming across the deck and you've got to stand like this um, trying to get it to work. So I think, I think the ruling is that you guys need them hardwired external antenna type of stuff. Is that not, not sure, still, still, still open? Um, so, one of the things we've seen is the Iridium Go, uh, not the Iridium handphones, come out with this tiny little um, 
antenna that has this tiny, tiny little cable on it. Um, and guys are like sticking them out in the companionway and then they're getting caught in the companionway hatch and breaking and it's, it's yeah, not a good day when that happens. Um, so there, there is different, obviously there's a lot of different types of systems for this. Um, I think especially if, if the Barley race goes um, satellite phone only and no, and no HF, I think you guys need to consider like a good, a good solution for it all to work. Um, if, it, if it doesn't work and something's going wrong and the guys can't get hold of you and your track is sort of going around in circles, um, it, it's, it's going to get hard. And I think, I think the ruling is that the sat phone has to be operational all the time. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess for you guys that's, that's going to be a lot of uh, trying to work out whether you need external antennas and, and on, on Iridium goes uh, and where, where, where you go with that. Um, it's going to be tricky just to be able to make a phone call. So you have to be aware that a lot of the handhelds and a lot of these devices still struggle to, to get to the satellites. Um, especially if you guys have bought some racing sails that have carbon in them, um, that can cause real big problems. Um, with the Iridium goes, the handhelds, these ones, these ones um, have all sorts of problems with trying to look through a carbon sail. Um, so you have to be aware of that sort of factor of, of all these type, types of units um, with them. So I guess from a, from a pricing point of view, where I think I think Iridium Go is sort of at the, at the lower end um, with 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 the systems. That's a, a terminal based system that you connect to your smartphones, then we have um, handheld phones for, I think to meet the rule, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but by the time you get an external antenna and you put it down the back of the boat, it, it is going to get up there. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the pricing of the sat phones um, from, from that point, but I think I think if you guys are serious about it, you, the little antenna out the companionway hatch is, is not going to be the go uh, from, a, from a safety point of view and it, and it working. Uh, for it, then obviously when you go up to these bigger terminals they actually come with a handset that's in the boat and it's powered off the boat and it is pretty much like a phone um, outside of the limitations of, of satellite. So I guess these and also handhelds get affected by rain fade. So if you are under some big wet rain clouds, um, you, you can get problems with your with your antennas not working um, for it. So all these type of things are a big consideration with your sat phones. So I don't I don't know if we're doing sat phone skids, are we? Or do TBA. TBA. Uh, so there, there might not be you know you might not have to send a message every six hours or, or something like that. So I guess we'll that that'll all come through. Um, with, with it all, um, and then so they, these are just a couple of the, the typical ones I guess we're, we're going to see. So um, at the top end of the spectrum, um, the, the Sailor Fleet uh, 150. Um, the next one down would be like uh, oh, it's actually not an original pilot port. Uh, that's a Lance um, Frame uh, unit. Um, that is a, a really good terminal. It's in the old phone. You put it in your boat, antenna out the back. It, it's pretty good, pretty good unit. And then we've got your Iridium Go. So Rob, Rob's going to talk about the Iridium Go because I feel like this is going to most probably fit the box for a lot of people for for the Bali race um, for it all. So I guess with with all of this and the, all these different types, and this is only like one percent of what you guys can get for sat phone stuff. Um, there's, there's a few things you need to be aware of. Um, coverage is, is, is one thing. So um, what we're going to be realise is there seems to be like sort of three main carriers that get used in Australia, which is Iridium, Imarsat and Thryer. Um, and Thryer. So this is, this is the Fleet One um, terminal and this, this is their billing sort of coverage area. Um, so the green 
is, is in an unlimited sort of data plan. We'll talk a bit about this, this next. Um, and then that, so the Iridium and Iridium and Imasat have pretty much got full coverage of Australia. Thryer say they've got full coverage um, of Australia. There has been a few unknowns there. And then internet. So this, this is a big question. So I guess all, all of this for everybody um, moving forward in this, in this era is whether I think for you guys it's going to be the big one. Um, there is, I think the first barley race we got hit by like 40 knots the first few days. That wasn't very pleasant. Um, so I guess hopefully you guys all have a really good barley race and it all just comes from the eastern near reach all the way to Bali. Um, but if it doesn't, weather is, is going to play a big role and the tide's coming in uh, at the other end, trying to woo your way into Bali. Uh, everybody might have seen some of them. If you didn't have like good internet, you most probably didn't see um, tides coming in at the other end. Some of them are pretty pretty horrible, I think, by memory when I did it. Um, so, email, I don't know how much of you, a lot of guys might need to email work or do, do any of that sort of stuff. And then Yellow Brick, we're all going to have one of them on the back of your boat. Um, I guess for the guys that are racing or wanting to be a bit competitive, I guess seeing where your competitors are is, is, is a big thing. So Yellow Brick um, offer the ability to do that. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a bit about optimising at, at the end. So with, with all these terminals for the, for the sat phones, like Iridium goes, uh, I'll just go back a couple. Iridium goes, the uh, Thry one on the top, and the Sailor. So all the, what we call the, s the smaller end of the spectrum, like the Iridium goes and the handhelds. Now, data over these things are painful at best of time. So to put it in perspective, like we're um, ADSL connection at home was running at two to 12 megawatts for most people coming into their house. Um, if we all remember dial up back in those days it was like nine to 12 kilobits per second. Both those units on the left are all running at 2.4 kilobits a second. Um, it is extremely slow. So if you are going to expect any decent data through them, it is, it is not going to work. Um, we will talk a bit about optimising and how you need to do that um, with them. But one big thing is you don't think that you're going to be able to watch Netflix over these things um, <laughs> on the way to Bali. Um, they, are, they are very slow. So you, you need to take that in consideration. The next thing is with these, um, to get that 2.4 kilobits per second, which is snail's pace in today's terms, um, you have to have seven bars on these things. So the Iridium goes and some of the Iridium stuff where the satellites aren't stationary, they're flying around. Um, you can run into a few little problems where if you don't have full bars on your Iridium go or your handheld zap phone, the data is going to be really hard to get um, across it. Like, um, with it, there's, there's a lot of compression software that needs to go on the computers to compress all the stuff that's coming through. So Rob, Rob will talk a bit about the Iridium goes uh, and, and, and that side of it. So I guess then we move up to the fleet broadbands. Now, these will give you a whopping speed of 35 kilobits per second, um, which is still barely usable in, 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 in terms th these days. The bigger the dish, the bigger the antenna, the faster it gets. Also, the more expensive it gets um, for them. So, in, in, in a sense, um, you, you really need to know what you want, what you want to get out of your system. Um, if, if you're happy to wait to get group files for your weather and stuff like that, then the lower end stuff is perfect. You just have to be, you have to realise that it can be quite painful um, sometimes to get it. We, we always get mixed reports. Um, what we find is it, it, it definitely comes down to um, operator use. So we know that the guys that have really researched, like the Iridium guys 
and, and this low bandwidth stuff um, seem to have um, a really good understanding of how to, how to make it work. Um, so I, I guess at, the, at this end, education on, on how they work is a really big thing and knowing the, the limits, so what we've just talked about, rain fade, weather, mass, external antennas out the back, all plays a really big part to getting your data um, in the boat. Um, if you want the data really fast, it as fast as you can get, the fleet ones are what we end up with. Um, you might see a few of them around the boat. These pretty much like dial up, but a bit faster than your dial up stuff. Um, so it is, it is a usable um, internet feed. Um, and I mean, so you can actually send emails, Google at very dangerously on them. Um, but they are, they, are a good, they are a good system for guys that are wanting that data really quickly or what we find is sometimes um, navigators or owners don't want to spend too much time going upwind looking at the nav station, <laughs> waiting for a group file to come over and an iridium go or something like that. So that's where these, these, these are good. Um, you can pretty much pick the phone up on these and dial straight away and get, get help as well. Um, unless they are pointing through your sale. So with all of these systems, whether it's Thryer, the Imarsat or the Iridium, you need to know what your satellites are doing with them and where they are. So especially if you do have a race boat and you guys are going north, Iridium have got two satellites that you can lock onto. Um, the main one I think we use is, I can't remember exactly what it is, if you're sailing north, it's out to your sort of... Um, Starboard bow is, is where, where, where it will be. So if you will have whatever reason a carbon mainsail and that is trying to look through it, you, chances are you're not, you're not going to get it. Uh, so you might have to either jive, bear away or move if the data is, is important um, with it. So with, with all of these um, coverage, it's making sure you're not, like what I've just spoken about, you know what you're trying to look at and with it. Uh, Internet. So I guess with, with all of this, um, price is a big thing. This, this whole satellite, when Meridium goes up, can, can get expensive really quick from, from hardware all, all the way through to your data plans and, and what you're trying to achieve out of it. So this is the, the one big thing with all these terminals, is you really need to know what you're getting yourself in for, for from a billing point of view. We, we've had some just absolutely horrendous bills come out of some of these things, like tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and a lot of people can't sort of just front that up to these satellite companies. A lot of people have tried to take them on and they, and they haven't gone that well. They, they keep coming for you. Um, so again, really, really understand what, what you're signing up to um, for them. So, I don't know if you can all, all read that. So this is a, a Fleet One plan um, at the moment that, that they're running. So for example, this is a 260 bucks a month subscription for it. So if you guys, it would be you know, one month um, subscription. Now, the way this plan works is you, are getting 32 kilobits till you hit 30 megabytes. So, and this is the big thing, is that we are all used to our NBN connections now and emails and photos and everything that are coming through that are in the megabytes. And we, in the satellite world, are still talking in kilobytes. So, when it comes to all of this stuff, people sending you emails and you sending emails out, you have to be careful that you're not, you know, you don't have your spam email coming in. So a lot of these things, not so much the little ones because they're not fast enough, but if you all decide to go fleet one or somewhere in between that, you have to be aware that you get charged everything that goes up to the satellite and comes down again, both ways. So when, when these guys talk about um, unlimited data and up to your 30 megawatts, Every time you're on your computer and you, 
your computer decides to do anything. And nowadays, like Windows 10, we, we don't know what it's doing. Um, but every single kilobyte or anything that tries to go looking for internet will go up through the satellite and come back down again. So even if, even if like, um, say, we as a provider to you guys, we, we can block stuff um, at, at, at the land end. So say for Google example or YouTube, we, we block that. Say somebody on the boat decides to look for the YouTube, it will send a little spot of data to ping their server and come back again. And you get charged for that. So you, you have to be aware they really trick out the data plans and, and what you've got. So it's not like at home when you go to television it's like, oh, you get 500 gigs um, download. These guys are like, you get 30 megabytes and yeah, it's for everything. Um, so you have to be aware of that um, with it. And so up in this plan here, it's 25 Aussie dollars per megabyte if you go outside the, outside the green. So that can rack up real quick um, for it. So you have to be super careful. Like if you go down one of these plans with us, like it will be a sit down afternoon and talk you through how to, how to use it um, just to try and stop any of that stuff, stuff happening. Um, the smaller units, even though they are really slow, you still can get yourself a bill um, with them if you decide to leave them ticking over, trying to get group files or, or stuff like that um, with them. And so and I guess with all this stuff, um, especially coming into the barley race for, for all you guys, so unfortunately a lot of this stuff is expensive. So this, this is one of the top end plans by the way, so don't like don't get super scared just yet um, for them. Rob will talk a bit about the Iridium Go stuff at the, at the lower end. Um, with, with all this stuff, Iridium Go and what we're going to talk about next, which is, is minimising data costs and, and how, to, how to deal with, with the sat phone as, as you go over the trip. Um, these systems are quite complicated um, to set up. Not so much the hardware, but it is the other end that usually causes the problem, the guys on the land end trying to work out what to let through and what to do and servers and emails and all that type of stuff. So my biggest recommendation for you guys is whatever you choose to go down and whatever path the barley raise is you need to set it up a month before and you need to go sailing um, and, 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 and test it um, to, make, to make sure it's working. Because um, we have had it too many times and we've had it at our own fault and we've had it at boat owner's fault and we've had it at service provider fault that people have left for Bali or they've left for certain races or cruises or Kimberley and they're like, we're halfway there, nothing works. And then it gets really hard to contact us to try and fix it. Um, so big recommendation. Unfortunately, it will cost that little bit more, but I think in the long run, you guys get them up and running and actually go sailing with them. Um, we found, especially with fleet ones and a lot of the Iridium guys, is you need to make sure your boat is, is going to work. So we've had guys like put the Iridium Go antenna on the back of their cruising boat and then they put the dinghy on the back. Um, and then they're like, oh, I've got some solar panels um, they put on. And then suddenly they're like, my Iridium Go doesn't work. All the antennas there. It's not like a GPS antenna or my mobile phone antenna, my VHF antenna. No, like, so test them, make sure make sure they work um, for, for it all. Um, so next, um, so with all this stuff, we want to avoid getting big bills. So in the game, we call it bill shock, and like I said, it, get, it gets pretty messy sometimes. So um, with it. Nowadays with the laptops and with so what Rob's going to talk about, the Iridium Go, they have their own sort of firewall and stuff in them for your weather. Iridium Go, for example, that will only work with Iridium Go certified applications. So if you think with Iridium Go that you're going to plug your computer in there and it's going to be like having just a really slow internet connection, it, it, it won't be. So the way Iridium Go have actually got this 2.4 kilobit per section to 
sort of download suite to work for everybody and, and for what we want to do with it. They basically have their own compression stuff that, that comes in. So everything that's, they've policed it. That, so I think predict wind application can, can use it and their uh, client sat and that email accounts and web browsing stuff is the only things that will work, will work with you in Go. So you, you have to be aware that you just can't plug your laptop in or connect your iPad to it, Wi-Fi and like off you go. Um, you have to know how those systems work for them. Uh, so it's a big educational trying to work out how they all work for you. But so like that's the limitation of like say the Uridium Go is certain applications only work with it. So then if you go down handheld sat phones, um, fleet ones, we have these optimizer red ports. Um, in previous times with computers at once we were able to stop them going looking for internet. Now we just we're just not geeky enough to work out Windows 10. Um, so these guys have invented these things. So if you already have like a handheld sat phone and you guys still want to try and get the data through it, uh, these optimizers are, are a gateway on the boat end. Um, so for the lower end terminals like a handheld sat phone that you plug USB cable into and you, you can download weather and stuff, um, these guys run a service Basically what it does is it stops Windows 10 and any Wi-Fi, like your Apple stuff, um, sending all that background data, trying to cram it through 2.4 kilobits a second up the satellite. So these work at both ends. They work at the lower end um, to stop data going out, to, to clog down your, your connection. Um, and then they work at the top end to stop too much data going out through the hole and costing you a lot. So depending on which way you go and what you want to do, whether you have old sat phones um, that still work. So if you guys have still got like old Iridium sat phones, not much has changed in that fact. You can still get data through them. Um, we would just recommend using something like this to try and control it all uh, with it, with it um, at the same, and then at this, at this end just to stop it all. So I guess we, we've had a few occasions with, with phone phone calls, and again, all the providers are different um, in regards to calling, so, and SMSing. So a lot of them, Iridium and Imarsat, have both got uh, online portholes for SMSing, and we find that this is the best way to talk to um, loved ones is over SMS or and the raised communities. It's the cheapest, and, and it seems to be the easiest. So. A lot of you guys at home can log on to the Iridium websites and they'll actually have a free SMS service out of their website. So you just need to know the boat's phone number um, um, to go there. So that's a really good way. So I guess also <coughs> phone calls from the boat. Uh, we'll go back to this one. This, this is quite good. So these guys, for example, quite cheap in, in the grand scheme of it. So voice to landlines, 83 cents a minute. Um, it starts to get dangerous, so how do you, it's, it's a bit of the wild west, or the satellite phone, they all tend to handshake deals and, and, and all sorts, so you've got to be really careful, so from I guess from you guys' point of view, is calling your mates on other boats. Um, down here you have to be really careful if you go from say an Iridium phone to, a, to an Inmarsat phone, for example, you could be up five, five bucks a minute. Um, to it. So this is another, like an education, like when you sign up for these things, read the fine print, and I know everybody doesn't, but you, you can get really caught out with it. And so the next big one thing about all these um, phones is people calling in is where you actually get really hurt. So a lot of the time nowadays, it's cheaper for you guys to call off the boat to home Calling, calling the other way can get pretty dangerous. So, for example, a Telstra mobile to an Inmar sat phone is, is $10 a minute. Um, 20, 20. For Iridium or for Inmar sat? We, we just had an instance where that went out of control. 
um, and we, we didn't pick it, we didn't even realise that Telstra were doing stuff like that. So, people calling into the boats, I guess, race committee, maybe. Um, be, be aware that, you know, we don't want any of the loved ones like, waking up to a Telstra bill that they can't jump over because they just wanted to talk to you for half an hour. Um, so, again, whatever you sign up for, keep, keep an eye on it and, and be careful. Um, you can definitely come and talk to us. We've seen it all now, just about set for that little Telstra incident. So, um, yeah, we, we can help help you out with it all. Look, I think that's pretty much from me now. So I'll um, hand you over to Rob. He's going to talk. I, th I think with all you guys, I think you're really going. He's going to be a really good fit um, for, for a majority of you, um, unless you really want. To, do, to, do, to go the, the higher end stuff, but um, yeah, Rob will talk a bit about the Iridium Gonia, um, so I'll hand you over to him. Cool, thanks John. <laughs> thanks Jonathan. Um, guys, thanks for the opportunity to come along and have a, have a bit of a chat tonight. A few of you might have seen my face, oh, my mate, I've been around the traps for a little while. Um, I was down here in, here in July um, speaking at uh, John Sanders' launch. Um, I sponsored John on his tent circumnavigation with one of these little babies and uh, I'm doing the same on his 11th um, in October. So um, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, just quickly, ClientSat, who are we? We, I'm an independent satellite airtime and hardware broker. I have eight um, satellite airtime providers that I use and negotiate with on behalf of my clients. 15 different hardware providers that I use, so I haven't sold my soul to anyone. Hence why it's called Client Sat. It's all about the client. It's not about me, it's not about the manufacturer, it's about the client. We're based here in Perth, um, although most of my business is elsewhere in Australia, because um, that's where the major cruising fleets are. This little fella, um, Jonathan, spoke about a number of things. One of the things he, he highlighted again and again and again was the need to have a decent external antenna. This is what we mount on the back of the Peribino 2. It's a very simple fix. Um, it has 10 metres of uh, military grade LMR 240 cable. Uh, the end of it even unscrews so that you can fit it through an 8 millimetre hole instead of an 18 millimetre hole. No one wants to drill bigger holes in their boats than we want to. And um, it, it just works. But you do need to understand, as Jonathan so correctly said, about the satellites. With Iridium, the birds come from the North Pole and go to the South. They may be to the east or west of you, you don't know. I've seen guys mount these up to mar on masts on spreaders and it's just the worst place in the world. It's not about height, it's about visibility. In an ideal world, you want 360 degrees horizon to horizon with these. Satellites take 10 and a bit minutes to come over and typically when you're downloading grid files, you're going to make a phone call, things like that, what I get in the habit of doing is looking at the signal strength indicator on the app or on the device and just watching it. And you will see it go from three to five and back to three. To download a grid file, um, and we talk about data size, Jonathan, um, to get a, a three to seven day forecast looking at wave, wind, um, uh, wave height, wind speed, um, and pressure. Um, I say to people to budget um, for about a 50 kilobit um, download, which is tiny, but that will give you that information. Um, if you go three weather models, it might take a smidgen more, um, and that's going to be about a two and a half to three minute call. So you've got the birds coming over, a 10, 10 minute to fly over, you have a look at it, you see it when it's getting going from 2 and going up, you've got another 5-6 minutes to get that where you've got really good 100% signal strength. So it's just some really simple things like that that are going to make the difference between the user experience that you have at the end of it. Um, with the GOES, uh, just a little bit about it, they come with... Um, in, in the marine bundle that we put together, they have a quick release catch on the back of them, it's on a wall mount. So if you've got to get out of a big boat into a small boat, you pull out two cords, you pull out the antenna, you pull out the USB cable, you slide that off and you put it in your pocket and you go. It has the SOS button on the side of it, which you would have had programmed probably into GEOS um, or anyone else that you want to do. Um, with GEOS, the way they handle it is that they will get, they will get a message they will then try and call the device. If that doesn't work, they'll go next to kin. If that doesn't get through, they'll go to, they'll find out where you are in the world. Here they'll go to AMSA, and I'll hand off to AMSA, and AMSA will take it from there. 
The other thing about the Iridium Go is your text messaging. And you can set up tracking with this. And what we're doing for, for John on his next trip, we're going to track him every five minutes. So we, we will receive a uh, text message, we'll have his Latin long, and that will be published into the system where you're going to be able to go publicly and see where John is any time of the day. Now you can do that back to your friends and family. They get a text message. I'm not sure they want to get one every five minutes, but when they do get it, um, they'll receive not only your Latin long, but they'll also receive a link on there. They click on that link, it opens up what looks like Google Earth, and there's Johnny. There he is on the spot. So it is, it is a quick way. You can also, you don't have to use that in anger. You can simply share your location. And when you do just share your location, you can actually type in the text message as well. So you can say, this is where we are. We're going to be here for another three days. You know, we're going to turn the SMS off or, or whatever you like to send out to, send out to people. Um, so yeah, good little unit. Um, and they are really taking the cruising um, market worldwide by storm. Um, you can shop online, you'll see some different prices. Uh, the prices that we have compete with the US um, very favourably, um, We all, but it's a different kit. In that, not so much the box itself, but the antenna cable, so it's, a, it's an easy install. The antenna has a different signal attenuation to the standard one that you get with Iridium Go. Our mounting kit is all, is all 316 stainless. It's not the cheap, nasty stuff that you get. Um, you get local support. When we do provide one for you here, it includes half an hour of that time to make sure that you're connected. You get to make and send your, your first phone call, send your first SMS, send your first email. That's, that's part of it. Try and get that from the US, 12 hour difference, lots of luck. In the, in the horrible event of a warranty claim, $150 freight back to the US and, and wait for it to come back. So, you know, beware of the internet world of buying things, particularly with Iridium Go, because people go, oh, price is cheap, I'll get it from there. John spoke about airtime a lot, and this is one of the things that I specialise in is, is airtime as an airtime broker. We can now set up almost any of the devices, and we certainly can with Iridium Go, with a standard Australian mobile phone number. So the days of horror bills going into it are gone. So people calling you are charged exactly the same as if they were calling your mobile. So probably no out-of-pocket expense because most of us have got unlimited calls to mobiles or heaps of allowance in our, in our bundles now. We also do that with the in ads. So instead of a $20 um, bill to ring in, you're phoning it for free. And with the in ad, the way we set it up is that people don't even charge, they're not even charged for the incoming call. There's, there's a number of different plans and I'm not going to go through all those with you right now, but what I'm saying is, I guess reinforcing Jonathan's comments, you have choice. So speak to those in the market and speak to those that have got some runs on the board and have looked after this industry and people in it that have got experience and not just someone that's flogging a box out of a shop and going, sure, you're right, mate. Um, Jonathan mentioned Thraya. Um, I put a lot of Thraya phones into the market. They work really well over here in the West. But, you know, over in the east, I've got a look-up angle of about 22 degrees above the horizon. It's about there. You know, you're in uh, Victoria, Tassie, anywhere near a hill, and you look up 22 degrees and you see rock, you will sit there for eternity. You will never, ever connect to that satellite. And that's, that's what a lot of people don't tell you when you go online to buy this sort of stuff. It's all about, you know, I typically spend about 20 minutes to half an hour with a new customer on the phone just working out what they want and, and going down that, down that path. I don't typically play too much in the in the in the fleet one and the and the bigger gear. Um, I have been doing a lot with the with the optimizer for about seven years, um, and with the with the Redport group. One of the things you see a lot of people um, they'll they'll see stuff online and they'll hear stories, and they become a lot of people get engrossed in what I call a forward, forward holding argument. Whatever you own, it's the best, and it was best with everything. It was waterproof and it never let me down, or unless you had the other experience, it was the biggest lemon you had a P76. Those are old enough to remember. Um, you will see people, and I've seen stories of people trying to plug these in just to a standard sat phone and without an external antenna. If you've got the external antenna and you've got the patience and you've got a bit of support setting it up, yeah, it's doable. Don't even think about it on InMarsat here in Australia. 
On, for the handhelds, the handshake time is just way too long and your bill will go through the roof. So if you get tempted to buy a second hand phone, talk to us first. And we'll just, I'm not gonna try and sell you something, but I'm gonna make you aware of the pitfalls so that, yeah, you don't, you don't get caught, okay? Um, where was I coming from? Give me one sec, I'll start a quick look at a couple of notes. Okay, with the Iridium Go, um, there are a number of different uh, bundles available for it. And one of the primary things why it has taken off so well is that on the data side of things, you cannot get bill shop if you, go, if you invest little money. If you go to the unlimited data plan, um, which works out, you'll see it advertised all over the world for about 139 US a month, you get absolutely unlimited data. You'll get unlimited text messages and you'll get a certain amount of voice calls included per month and that can vary between 50 and 150 minutes of voice calls per month depending on who we put you with. So the good thing about it is that if you do forget to shut down, shut down the session, and it should be automatic, but if you do forget to shut down the session or it doesn't do it automatically, it doesn't matter. You're not charged any more than that 139 or the Australian equivalent. So there's lots of different airtime bills. We can, we can have them so you can drop them down, you can suspend them. A lot of my cruising guys will, um, they won't, I mean, I don't even ask them to sign up on a 12, 12 month or two year plan anymore. Um, there are some available, but typically what they'll do is that when they get to where they're going, they'll drop it down to one of the lower plans, and then when they're ready to sail again, they'll simply email me, we'll put it up to the higher plan, and, um, then they've got their unlimited data again. There's a lot of places in Asia where there's very, very good mobile coverage and they just don't need the satellite. But they do need it when they, when they go on from there. Um, also with the Iridium Goes, what a lot of people were doing was cancelling their service. And, and I understand that because, you know, when you're paying 139 a month, it's about 215 Aussie at the moment. Um, you don't want to be kicking that along every month out of your, out of your bank account. So what they would do is that they would cancel it and then in three months time they would reconnect. That all works well and good, but with Iridium you either A, have to get a new SIM card. Now, not that SIM cards are expensive, but you don't normally take a couple of them when you go. I normally, with my clients, suggest they do get an extra couple. If they don't take an extra one and they want to reconnect, Iridium charge me, who I then on pass to you, 230 US just to reconnect that same SIM card. So that takes the joy out of cancelling it for one month and then deciding that you want to hook it back up again. With our new service, with the mobile numbers, you can actually disconnect the card and you can reconnect that same card up to two years down the track. So there's a lot more flexibility coming into the market, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of things to it. So please use what, you know, what you've got it out at your disposal through us. Um, Jonathan talked about the compression software, and yes, the Iridium Go, it is in its native format, it will only work with a smart device, so any, any of the smartphones or the, or the good, you know, the Android or the Apple tablets, it will work with that for your emails, voice and, uh, and data downloads. A lot of people do like um, using laptops, so we have uh, we have some software uh, which is actually Xgate out of the US, is designed by the people that make Redport. Um, here in Australia, we call it Client Satmail, and you can download that onto a Mac or PC, and then you can then send your emails, download weather on via a Mac or a PC as well as your as your smart devices. I always recommend for people to install it across multiple devices not to use it on each one, but so that you've got backup. If, you're, if your smartphone dies, your tablet dies, or your laptop dies, you've always got that, always got that backup. Um, I think that's pretty much it for me. I just wanted to give you a quick heads up on the, on the Iridium Go. Um, as I say, when you, if you do want to go down that path, give us a call. Let's have a chat and work out if it is for you. It may not be. If it is, everything's a compromise. There is no silver bullet in any of this. You know, <laughs> um, you know. People say to me, "Oh," and I get it all the time. "Oh, I'm heading bush, 
or I'm going away on the yacht, I want to run my business and I need all my cloud services, my MyOb and my Google and all the rest of it, and I go, I hope your business is making a truckload of money because otherwise you're going to go backwards. We can do anything, it's just how deep your pockets are. Nothing's impossible, but it's just how much you want to pay. And typically people don't want to pay, so that's why we come back to that little puppy there that works, works really well. Jonathan, I'll, I'll hand back. Yep, Bill, thank you. Look, just a couple of comments before we got on to uh, any questions. Uh, just a point of clarification uh, in terms of uh, HF radio. So um, for the rally boats, um, that will definitely be on satellite phone. Um, if you've got HF, you can use it, but it's not required for the, uh, for the rally boats. Uh, for the race boats, uh, we just lodged an application this week uh, to, to get exemption uh, from HF and um, from talking to Australian Sailing, I think that should be fairly, uh, fairly automatic. So for the race boats, uh, or for all the boats, we'll have the choice between, um, between uh, satellite and, uh, and uh, HF. Uh, in terms of uh, AIS, as you would have seen, um, AIS transmit is a requirement. Uh, for the race boats, because that's a Cat 1 race, and so it's required for that. But it's also a requirement for the rally boats, and that's because uh, the Indonesian government requires AIS transmit as part of their relax, as a trade-off for their relaxation of um, entry requirements. So um, Indonesia's gone the same as Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, all of them require AIS transmit, and it must be switched on at all times, um, so they can keep an eye on where you are and what, you, and what you're doing. Uh, but one thing I will say is, look, the only time I've, had, I've ever had ships alter course for me at night is after we put AIS transmit on the boat. So I've used radar reflectors and bloody, you know, the best navigation lights. Ships don't give a damn about that, but they do pay attention to AIS transmit. So there is a benefit from, uh, from, from, putting, it, from putting it on your boat. Um, the last thing is in terms of um, AIS uh, beacons, um, the personal beacons. We said we, we did a trial a couple of weeks ago, um, rather mixed results, I have to say, uh, learning experience for everybody. My plan is to do another trial, um, certainly before one of the races, uh, but depending on how that goes, we might do another trial uh, and we can just run here in the marina uh, where everybody can go out and uh, we can set off a beacon, everybody can go out to their boat and see how it actually comes up. Because as Jonathan says, it's equipment specific, it's also software specific, and it's transmitter device specific. So um, I think that's probably something we'll do um, um, before, uh, before Bali, just so people are familiar with what it is. Because, you know, we're going to be a fair way out at sea, and, um, you know, it took um, two hours to respond to a PLB um, five miles off Mandurah. So um, halfway to Indonesia, the time is only going to go up from there. So in terms of recovering a man overboard, um, if you haven't got a visual sight with lights or whatever, then uh, personal AIS is the, uh, is the best option out there. So anyway, that's just my comments. Um, look, opportunity, Jonathan's up for, and, and Rob are very happy to answer questions. Jonathan's also uh, got set up to do a demonstration of a personal AIS, um, so we can run that as well. So I'll hand it over to... Uh, to Jonathan first. All right, uh, question time. Anybody? Anybody? So, John, if you, if you are as required uh, transmitting AIS 24 7, like when you're in Vanoa Harbour, you have to leave your unit on and transmitting. Uh, how much power will that uh, uh, use up, and uh, will the boat's battery be able to keep up with that? Yeah, good question. Um, so, it, it will depend on what unit you guys buy on how, how much they draw. Um, we, as when we install them on the boat, it, it comes down to sort of how we actually install it in your boat. So a, a typical install now is to have two units, an antenna splitter um, to the VHF and the AIS back box itself. Um, when we wire these in, we will wire usually both of them to the VHF circuit breaker or however your VHF is powered, just because we want the splitter from a safety point of view to turn on all the time with your um, VHF. So depending on how the system, what AIS units you have, 
they they will draw power. So I guess from Steve, you can turn your VHF on if we wire that way. When you're in port, they they slow down the transmit. Um, the time is is with five, almost over five minutes. I think I think I'd have to go through the notes. So as you start getting faster and faster, the transmit time goes up um, for them. So sitting in the port in Benoa Harbour, look, they will flatten your batteries. Um, after a while, so don't leave, leave the boat. So I guess from that point of view, if you need to leave it on, you either leave your batteries on, and it really comes down to what else is drawing off the boat, to how long you get out of your batteries. Um, so we can wire them directly to the batteries if we need to for you for that for that reason. But yeah, it's, um, it's a, can't be done, and they don't draw too much. So, but they will eventually get you. Uh, anything else? Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, what, what part of the system, like satellite or man overboard uh, beacons? Both? Both. Okay, I guess from the cheapest point of view and the best the for the satellite stuff is the Iridium Go. Um, for the satellite stuff is, is most of really the best and cheapest, I think. Oh. So the two words don't normally go in the same sentence. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but yeah, it, it's, it's, the best, it's the best value compromise for, for the satellite comp. Yeah, okay. Yeah, for, for, for that. So I guess realistically that would be one of the best things to go for all you guys uh, for it. Um, the AIS, for you to grow up with these. Look, I, to be honest, I, I don't know what the cheapest one of these are. Um, I guess you will find a lot on the internet. Um, like I said earlier, Buy beware with them and make sure what, what, what they do and what they what they suit you for. So I don't I don't actually know which is the cheapest one of these out there. Um, that they could be scattered all over the internet. Um, yep. Um, so what's the difference between the effectiveness of that type of equipment and a personal e-perms? So the personal e um, I think we all we all race with them now. Um, I think Bill just spoke about one. So personal EPIRB is when you set that off, that is going to a satellite. That signal goes to a satellite and then it goes down to our um, sea rescue coordination centres. So with EPIRBs, I think there possibly are some of the iridiums that do it. I think I'm not sure. Um, sorry. But the satellites are flying across so if you're lucky enough when you do go overboard and you do set it off and one's above you by the time it gets up to the satellite if, if you if you're in good reception of one and then down to the coordination center and they work out that it's not a false alarm going off um, can be up to what was it two hours, two hours? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the, two, the two hours was finished there it took the two hours between the first PLB being triggered and the rescue bug getting yeah, so, 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 and there was a lot of time lost along the way, and lots of steps where a personal AIS would have been would have taken five minutes, and there was boats within fifteen minutes of the stair at the time. So, so it could have been. There's nothing to go. The no, no, no. It's no it's that's that's it's the catch. That's the yeah. catch. Personally, it goes off, and you're relying on somebody in AMSA deciding, oh, geez, this looks like a. a We'll contact somebody, and I'll contact somebody, and they'll try and contact the boat. Yeah. So, so, so helicopter, just helicopters and, and planes that are geared up to see um, your personal e perps will we'll send them, but they've obviously got to come and, and see it. So, these are, are pretty instantaneous on that front. Yeah. Jonathan, can, can you confirm that you said that some of these um, personal beacons have both DSC as well as AIS? If they have DSC, presumably they have to have their own MMSI. Do you use the same MMSI as off your boat? And in that case, will it actually alarm on your own boat on the same MMSI? Yeah, okay, good question. So, again, it is a really open-end market for these. So, um, the MMSI numbers are 
set to these. They, they come with their MMSI number and they actually have a different beginning number for them. Some of them that have DSC will do an all ships um, DSC call, which I think the one that you did for the test had it. These ones, for example, you they have got their own MMSI number, but you can program your boat's MMSI number in these to set your VHF radio off and not anybody else's. These ones have an all ships, but you have to press and hold the button in them. Um, I will check the manual on that, but I'm pretty sure I read that yesterday when I was looking through through the manual. So again, buyer beware of of what these are actually capable of doing and and then the next one is, is making sure that they do go off on your life jacket um, is, is another big one for them so yeah it, it is still very different to which which units you buy so you have to be aware so i guess these ones for example i think these are 399 um, for, for each of them and so this is at the top top end I think it's either 299 or 399. I think Whitworth have got them for that. Um, these are at the top end of, of them, so DSC, AIS. These, I, I'm not sure where they, where they retail, only because I was looking at the price of these yesterday. I know that. Um, but so, yeah. If you want to do a test on one of those, who is it alerting? Yep. Okay, so all of them have different test functions. Again, specific to which ones they are. They will broadcast a test, a pretty, these ones are like half power, so we'll do a test after this, so we'll, we'll sort of have to get everybody up here to do that, and I'll get Bill, because he, he knows and Steve to set his one off um, again, and we might all just have to cram around the chart plot up to, to see it, um, and I'll, I'll have it up on a computer as well. But um, when they do do a test transmit, everybody will see that, the message that comes up on the chart plotters or anything is, it is chart plotter dependent, but it will say test SART or man overboard AIS test um, to it. So it'll alert anybody when you're doing the test around that um, it's only a test and they're not actually going off um, on that. So when you do do the tests on them, that you can see that they're a test at, at, at other ends. Um, I guess like we set one off, um, by accident earlier on, um, and, it, and, it, and it showed up, and nobody, nobody has read it. We've run the water police and told them that we're going to do some tests on them. Yeah. Just, just on that, the uh, a lot of the cruise ships now are fitting these to their life rings, and before they leave port, they go around for every life ring that's fitted and do a test, and on the bridge they uh, count them all off to so say yeah. they have, uh, have worked. Yeah, so it, it's it's and it's, it's a really new thing in the shipping for, for them, but yeah, it's that they are proven to work. So, and and we spoke about the same guys up up in Europe before each race are testing each each one one of them. Yeah, it seems that um, instead of it coming up with a long number on the screen, you know, uh, if it was possible to edit that number and say put in the boat name or something, that might be more useful. But I don't know if that's possible to do that. No, it, it, it's, it's, it's not, I don't think, with any of the models at the moment. Um, only because of just what they are, you know. Is, is, is there to tell you that a man or a board's gone? So that function of being able to program your AIS beacon with your MMSI number um, can, can make sure that, like, for whatever reason that you, you're in a fleet, Ten boats and you all get knocked over at once. You can all work out this. I think um, I know on some of the AIS on ours, which is Vespa, you can actually tell the, unit, the transceiver that that MMSI number on that unit it is one of yours. It, yeah, so yeah, okay. we actually gone and lined them all up so you can have number one, number two, yeah, okay. number three. Yep. So in that way, you can tell whether it's someone who's fallen off your boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, or whether it's and, and that's it's in your it, radio, or, or it's, it's in the Vespa unit itself. Oh, okay. The AIS unit. Oh, and the AIS. So you can tell yeah, the okay. AIS yeah, unit I didn't know about that. Yeah. What number that is, and so if it it doesn't show up. Oh, as a as the, bu as the yeah. buddy function. Yeah. So like yeah, thing. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so what he's just talked about um, is is some AIS units, depending on what they are, have a have a find your buddy, <laughs> or for example, he's you've nicknamed, I guess. 
your AIS beacons, yeah. MMS items. Well, you, can, you can also tell um, if someone comes on board, one of the crew, and you just test it, and the, the uh, AIS unit will then check that they, their system actually works, yep. and you can give it a number, you know, Fred or whoever. Fred yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah you like, that's that's yeah. really good. So, so you've lined you up know it works, yeah. all your all your personal beacons with each crew number. Yeah. Um, so I guess I guess the cruising guys for, for what he was talking about. So race boat guys all revolve around numbers um, from one to twelve, uh, and you tend to line everything up: your spoon, one to twelve, your cup, your mug, and your EPIRB and your personal AIS beacon. So that's a really good. Good, good way of doing it with the Vespa one. I haven't actually even seen that. The I know of the buddy. The same functionality on the uh, chart box as well. Right? The same functionality on the oh, chart box? Yeah, as a, as a buddy thing? Yeah, okay. So yeah, some chart plotters, I actually haven't had a good look into that. So yeah, buddy system on your chart plotter with your man overboard beacons, definitely worth having a look at. I'll have a look now that I know about it. Um, and go from there. So if you have one of those that doesn't have a DSC call sets off, it just shows up on everybody's chart plotter as another target. Has it got something with that some distinctive thing that tells you? Yeah, so... People whether it's a man overboard? Yeah, oh, yeah. so it, it depends on your chart plotter on how it's going to show, but it will definitely be different to a normal target. Right. Um, so some of them will call them um, an AIS SART. Um, that... An AIS SART is a little bit different to these things, but, but similar. AIS SARTs, uh, they come out of the shipping shipping type of stuff. Um, so sometimes they will show up as an AIS, what they call SART, or they'll be like a man overboard AIS beacon. It really is chart plotter dependent, but they will definitely be different. Um, the way their MMSI numbers are coded is what sets them apart from just another target. Uh, but, so a search and rescue target, I think. Yeah, yeah, they're correct, yeah. Um, so we, we don't see them too much in, in, in the pleasure industry, SARTs. It's, it's definitely a big shipping side of it, radar SARTs and, and, and all of that. So I won't, I won't go too much into that um, at all. Um, any, anything else? No, all good. Um, so you guys are ready, I guess if anybody, you guys would want to go home, go to sleep, but we'll, we'll set some of these off if I get, um, you do, because you know how to set them off and we'll have a look. So, if anybody wanted to come up, like, that, I know a couple of guys have actually got these chart bottles on their boats. Yeah, I guess they're all guys with computers. Um, another trap. <laughs> <laughs>
Up there further, up that way.
Small one. Yeah. I my thing was more about the post because Move me knife. I'm going to put it there. Yes, that's. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah
Thank you. 